So I wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this is the last workshop of our January sessions. We'll have more in February, which I'll talk about after David's presentation. Um, just a few housekeeping things for the moment, if you can stay muted, just so we don't have any strange background noises that happen. Um, and then if you have any questions that come up, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll go over them after the presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce you to David Pettigrew, who is a professor of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State University, where he's taught since 1987. Uh, he created a course titled An Introduction to Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Stories of Resistance, Rescue, and Survival, where he's been teaching since 2013. He is also a member of the Connecticut Advisory Committee on Holocaust and Genocide Education. And I feel that is a very short blurb of all the wonderful accomplishments that David has done throughout his career and life. So I'm going to hand it over to him to um, start his presentation. Okay, I'm not muted. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. I, uh, I have some preliminary things that I'll say, and then we'll go to a, uh, a PowerPoint. I thought uh, it was a relatively small number here. We might have a chance to Introduce, introduce ourselves and say where we're from. You want to try to do that? Uh, you could introduce yourself, say where, where you're from, and uh, maybe if you have any interest, a particular interest in Bosnia, we can mention that. And, and of course, if we will, hopefully we'll have time for that discussion at the end. Hi, I'm Nick Dolitowicz. Uh, I'm from Crosby High School in Waterbury. I teach uh, the oh. ECE Intro to Human Rights and Intro to Genocide Studies at Crosby High School. And Great. I actually wrote my uh, senior thesis on the Bosnian genocide Excellent. many senior years ago. Senior thesis where? Uh, Mount St. Mary's University in Maryland. Very nice. Okay. Who's here? Who, anybody else want to chime in? Hi, I'm Kim Klatt. I'm in uh, the Phoenix, Arizona area. And I work with the Educators Institute for Human Rights where we've done some work in Bosnia. Oh, excellent. Great. Hi, um, I am uh, Sarah Wiederecht. I am uh, an associate teacher at Manchester High School in Connecticut. Um, I also, I teach world history, but I also teach uh, introduction to human rights and genocide studies also through the ECE program, so. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Uh, hello, I, I, I'm Skander Hatibovic. I'm from Bosnia, I'm from Sarajevo. I uh, run a travel agency here, Funky Tours, and we do a lot of study tours in Bosnia in regard to genocide in Bosnia. Uh, professor maybe knows me, we have met last year uh, here in Bosnia. So I'm looking forward to, uh, I mean, join the conversation and See. Yes, oh, of course. Uh, great, great to see yeah. you, Skander. And we, yeah, we went to uh, Srebrenica. Yes. Specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette Broad. I am a Jewish synagogue educator, currently doing some volunteer work with Sarah at Voices of Hope. Excellent. Okay. If anyone else wants to say hi. Uh, it looks uh, like Nicholas has popped in the chat that he is in Norwich, Connecticut. Okay. Well, I can, I can get the ball rolling and we'll have, hopefully have time uh, at the end to chat. Uh, so I, I, I had a note here, but first I'm just like to welcome everyone and, and also thank the Voices of Hope uh, the Hero Center and the Connecticut Department of Education, and especially Sarah Snyder, who is the director of the Hero Center for all the arrangements for this, uh, this sort of a, gen a January uh, a January series of workshops. And we uh, we had one one uh, amazing workshop by Sarah about uh, studying the the Holocaust through artifact artifacts. And, uh, and then a, a, a joint workshop of Allison Norrie from Fairf Fairfield Ward High School, Stu Abrams from Avon, 
if I've got that straight, and my and myself talking about uh, courageous cor courageous uh, civic engagement by people during the during the uh, the, ho the Holocaust. Uh, so this is the, this is the last of the January series, but we have another another workshop coming in in the future that I think Sarah's going to talk talk about eventually. Uh, and uh, so again, welcome to uh, participants, uh, colleagues, and students. I see some of my students here from my Holocaust and Genocide Studies class at Southern, which is just great. Uh, this this morning, uh, Elimana. Memisevich, who's a survivor of the Visegrad genocide, spoke to my students, and so they're uh, they're they're having a, a lot of enrichment today. At the beginning of the semester, we're front loading a lot of information about Bosnia. So I think we'll be beginning, if I could say that somehow, in Medias race, uh, in the middle of things, and hope that some aspects of the Bosnian genocide, which occurred from 1992 to 1995 will emerge from my uh, you know, discussion of these specific or more narrow instances. Uh, but, but first, I'm, I'm thinking today, how, how's my sound, by the way? It's okay. I, I feel like I, I'm yelling when I'm wearing a mask. So I've, normally, I'm, normally I'm trying to project like I'm on the, the, the stage at the opera. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about our session in the context of the recent UN General Assembly resolution, which you probably know about, passed on January 20th. It was the uh, 80th anniversary of the, the Vansi Conference. The UN resolution was a response to the troubling rise of Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, hate speech, and hate acts. The resolution, which was a joint uh, proposal of the Israeli and German ambassadors, and then was co-sponsored by Bosnia, um, among others, urges member states to develop educational programs about the Holocaust. So it's really condemning Holocaust denial and urges member states to develop educational programs about the Holocaust in order to prevent future acts of genocide. And it, and it specifically commended countries that have, quote, actively engaged in preserving those sites uh, that served as Nazi death camps, concentration camps, forced labor camps, and killing sites in order to educate current and future generations. The resolution emphasized repeatedly that remembrance and education are crucial for preventing future acts of genocide. <clears throat> so I'd like you to, to try to keep this in mind this commendation for those who have actively engaged in preserving those sites that served as Nazi death camps, or for example, uh, uh, concentration camps, forced labor camps, killing sites, or something like Theresienstadt, for example, which, which is uh, pres preserved, uh, in order to educate current and future, uh, current and future generations. So this, this um, Workshop was built as a as an inquiry based, right? And and uh, I wanted to say something about that, in the sense that I'm trying to discuss the genocide in Bosnia in terms of a system of concentration camps that was in operation uh, as part as part of the genocidal effort in Bosnia that was described in the Karadzic judgment, Radovan Karadzic, who was convicted of genocide. Uh, uh, as an effort to, quote, permanently remove all non-Serbs from Bosnian Serb claim territory. So that was this, this phrase that was repeated in the, the Karadzic judgment, that it was part of a joint criminal enterprise aiming to remove, permanently remove all non-Serbs. It specified uh, bo uh, not, not, uh, bo Bosniaks and, and Croats from Bosnian Serb claim territory, which was Republic of Srpska. So, uh, and I, I think of it as a, a kind of an inquiry-based context because we and our, our our colleagues and our students will begin with some familiarity with the, with the idea of concentration camps. Uh, this, the sec, this, the, the, another aspect of what I'm calling this uh, 
inquiry-based approach is that what I'm going to talk about involved at least at least the first uh, half. We'll talk about my my own uh, kind of inquiry-based research and discovery when I when I was in Bosnia uh, last summer. It seems like so long ago now in the in the midst of the the cold winter. Uh, so I, I have to say that a, 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 a friend contacted me, and uh, you know, during the during the pandemic, amidst the pandemic, when it it seemed like no one was going anywhere, and said she was doing research in uh, DNA identification because she was working on her uncle's case. Her uncle had been executed, and uh, his remains had never been identified, and his his death certificate claimed that he had died of natural causes, but there was, there was a witness to his, who, who sur to his execution who survived and became a, a, wit a, you know, a witness for the, for the prosecution. And so some, sometime uh, I, I, I knew she was working on this, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the friend was a, uh, a child during the siege of Sarajevo and asked me, at some point, if I would go with her to visit her uncle's execution site. Uh, be, because of the location, uh, one could say the trauma and perhaps some, some risk or you know, a sense that there would be some risk in going to that area, she had never been there before. And uh, it was, it's, it, it's in the area where her family, had, where her, her mother had grown up. But, there's a sense uh, that people are were reluctant to return after the genocide, which we can we can talk about. Uh, so she asked if I would if I would go along, uh, and so somehow amidst the somehow amidst the pandemic, I remember uh, arranging to uh, to arrive in spite of flight complications, and somehow. On our on the scheduled day and plan, we we're on our way to uh, the execution site on August first. Uh, so the first part of the presentation is part of what I discovered on August first. So I think I'll I think I'll try to share my uh, PowerPoint with you now. Let's see how this goes. We should, we should all be experts at this by now. Uh, view. Uh, so this is uh, looking at, you could say, some threads for the for the discussion. Would we'll be looking at concentration camps, as as I mentioned, but also uh, another aspect of the inquiry would be thinking about the glorification of war criminals and the suppression of memorials for the victims. Uh, this morning, when uh, Elimana spoke to my, my students. She had these great maps of Bosnia, the former Yugoslavia, and I, I quickly realized I needed some, and I included these just before the talk began. So for, so for context, you can see Bosnia amidst the other federal republics in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, this, this is the same, same idea, although, uh, uh, Macedonia had, is no longer named Macedonia as a new name. It's, uh, can anybody help me and remember the name of that? Northern Republic of Nor Northern Macedonia? It's now no North Macedonia, Republic yes. of North Macedonia. Republic of North Macedonia. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this first, the first part, of, the, of my discussion, we'll talk about the uh, uh, travel from Focha to Kalinovic. Well, first from Sarajevo to Focha. Uh, and this, this is the maybe the only part of the presentation where you have to do a little work of actually looking, looking at the slide, at the slide a after this would be much easier to see. And I am not sure how to move this out of the way. Okay, that worked. So what, what we're looking at here is uh, what, what I'd like to describe, what I'd like to try to explain eventually is the, the, the devastating aspect of the genocide. 
for the communities that were affected, which can be sort of easily discerned from the, the census data. So this is from the official census site. And you see there was a census, a census in 1991. And then the next one, because, because of the genocide, the conflict and uh, post-conflict reconstruction, the, the next census came in 2013. So you see in this, now this is for Focha municipality and Focha municipality is here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. It's in the lower right-hand corner. It's a, 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 like a red area with, with a dark black line around it. That's Focha municipality. And uh, you can see that in Focha municipality in 1991, there were more than 17,000 uh, Bos Bosniaks or uh, Bosnian Muslims and 16,000 roughly Serbs. And then in 2013, the, the number of Bosniaks has dropped from 17,000 to 1,000. So that's in, that's in the municipality. The, the number of uh, Serbs has remained about the same. Okay, so that's uh, ideas clear. And then within Focha municipality, there's the town of Focha, which is here in the sort of in the middle of the municipality, where you can see what seems like even more dramatic figures from 5,500 Bosniaks to 83 from 1991 to 83. And the Serb population, Bosnian Serb population has increased slightly from 7,000 to 10,000. So this is uh, uh, something that I, I also found this uh, an important resource for, for trying to understand and articulate the effects of genocide. This would also be true uh, of other of other parts of Bosnia, especially Visegrad, but we we, we can uh, we can always have a follow up discussion about that. I'd be happy to be in contact with anyone. Uh, so the the Bosniak the population in Focha was was decimated through murder, forcible forcible displacement, inhumane detention, torture rape and enslavement among other crimes. And the violence against women in Focha led to a landmark ruling by the ICTY, a, a ruling that inscribed rape in the annals of jurisprudence as a crime against humanity. In the early months of the uh, aggression, all 12 mosques were destroyed, including the noted Alaja Mosque that had been built in 1549 and was designated as a UN, uh, a UN, UNESCO World Heritage Site. As a result of this genocidal process, Bosniaks were almost completely eliminated from Focha as part of this goal to achieve ethnic homogeneity. And in the uh, Krajnik verdict, we read the following, that as a result of these crimes, quote, all traces of Muslim presence and culture were wiped out of Focha. In 1994, in fact, the town had been renamed Serbinia or Serb town, which has since been changed. Now, it, along, with, along with what I'm explaining, we, we arrived in a, on August 1st, quite early in the morning in Focha for a, a commemoration of the, of, of, of the you know, re, re, remembrance of the victims of the genocide that was taking place on this bridge. Uh, there is no memorial in, in the town for the victims. So that's been suppressed. So, the, so the, uh, the, the commemoration took place on the bridge over the, the river, which is the Drina River. You can see the, as I said, these other slides will be easier to, to gather the meaning of. But so here we are on the bridge and uh, I have a few slides from the commemoration. Uh, Ishtina Kalinovic is, is a victim, Victims Association. It's truth, truth of Kalinovic or Kalinovic truth. So you can see, get a sense that there is a commemoration and pro process on uh, August 1st, where people gather for uh, speeches and music and uh, I, I 
I can't quite see my uh, my screen effectively. So I'm going to I'll try to put and uh, and then sort of the culmination of the commemoration and the lack of a permanent memorial is that that the the participants put white roses in the in the river in in remembrance of the victims. So the, this was that that moment of the roses being put in the river. And you can see them. I think you can see them in the water. And I mentioned that the the, the mosques had been destroyed. Uh, all, all 12 mosques were destroyed, including the Elijah Mosque. And it was uh, rebuilt from, so it was originally built in 1549, destroyed in 1992, and then rebuilt from 2016 to 2018. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of evidence in the, in, in, in the prosecutions of the, of the perpetrators that there had been a, you know, a, that, that mosques themselves had been targeted. They weren't the, they, they weren't uh, collateral damage, let's say, but that efforts had been made to level them, to enter them and blow them up from the inside to make sure that the, the traces of the Muslim presence, as the, as the trial said, are erased. So I, I just thought it was important to show some images of the, the restoration of, of the mosque, which had, and there had been an incident recently where it had been, uh, had been shot at. But so there was a, after the, after the uh, commemoration, we went back to the mosque. I had a chance to meet with some of the local people and also with the imam from the mosque. We talked to him a little bit about the community, and the work that he does. But these are just some pictures of the, this uh, mosque, which is known historically for being so beautiful. Uh, this is Imam Fadl, Fadl, who was nice enough to pose with me here in the mosque. And alongside the suppression of memorials for the victims, you have a, a prevalence of uh, glorification of convicted war criminals, which is actually now illegal, illegal in Bosnia. There's a law that was passed. Uh, at Infocha, there's a, a mural of Ratko Mladic. It was, paint, it was painted over after pressure from the top UN diplomat, but this was the mural before it was painted over. Uh, this is Ratko Mladic, who has been convicted of genocide for Srebrenica and other, other war crimes. And you see, this is, uh, I managed to find the location and photograph it. This is the, uh, the site after it had been painted over under pressure from the high representative. I'm surprised that they removed it. But what I discovered is that across the street, there was a nationalist slogan that said something like, through fire and storm, your name resonates across Republic of Srpska, and that had not been removed. So the so the this sort of glorification uh, continues. And and then uh, I didn't see everything. I, I I didn't achieve all of my objectives, but we we did find on a municipal building only blocks away. This is a Focha municipal building. Uh, maybe the Veterans Association. There's a permanent, you can see, see that on the right, a permanent poster of uh, Mladic there. So this, these are, these are om omnipresent in, 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 and in other ways. So following the uh, commemoration in Focha, we, we set out for, for Kalinovic. And Kalinovic is, uh, this is Kalinovic municipality. Here you can see uh, 1991, it's small, smaller, uh, 1300 Bosniaks today, 57. Or 19, I should say in 2013, 57. And, and then this is, you can see the town of Kalinovic in the middle here of the municipality on the right, uh, 244. Bosniaks in, in 1991 and seven in 2013. So you have that dramatic reduction. So we, uh, this is where uh, my 
friend and I were looking for the execution site and uh, we're traveling from Focha, as you can see on the right, almost directly across the map to Kalinovic. At some point, we went off the road here at uh, Miljevina towards Jel Jelic. And I'm not sure because there were no, no, you know, markers along the way. I'm not sure exactly where we found. Uh, I, I, I can figure that out, but this was the, this was the path. And this, this was the, the road when we were off the main road. Uh, it, it was a, sort of this endless uh, dirt sort of gravel road. And the, the, my uh, friend's uh, uncle's name was Abderrahman Filipovich, who was called Uncle Brazzo. And this, this is one of the surviving photographs of un Uncle Brazzo. He was a, uh, a physician in Kalinovic and a uh, very respected uh, intellectual. And they say he, he, he really, I mean, the, what, well, I should say that what's, what's important is that his, his uh, niece uh, is, is discovering, is really investigating and discovering a lot about his personality as part of this project and, and his friends and beginning to make connections to, to come to know the uncle that she never knew. Uh, but it, at this point, we're on our way to Tuzlakova Stala execution site on this gravel road. And this is where Aida's uncle, Abdurrahman Filipovich and Samir's father, Salko Ranovich were executed uh, August 5th, 1992. And in, in, neither of their human remains have been identified. So you can see here down on the right, in the lower, I, I think you can see on the lower right-hand side, a, a kind of memorial to the, uh, at the execution site. This is possible because it can't be seen from the road and you know, no one really would, would go there without the intention of seeing this memorial. So this is our visit to the uh, memorial. Uh, so the execution site was this, this area right behind the, the memorial. So one of the, one of the, uh, the victims, you know, survived as, as, as did happen occasionally and managed to drag himself to safety and find uh, someone who, who, who nursed him back to health and then later became a, a witness for the prosecution. Uh, then the, the, uh, the victims from that execution site, and there were execution sites all along this road. It, the, Samir called it this, like the, ro the road of death. Uh, they were, were brought from a concentration camp, which is just up the, uh, up, up the road. As you see, I, 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 it wasn't, uh, but you can see we've emerged from the forest and we're out on this uh, plateau, shall we say, ap approaching the, uh, it's called Barutni Magazine Concentration Camp, the main detention site uh, or main de detention building on the site. Barutni Magazine means a gunpowder warehouse. So it had been a, a, a storage site for munitions, presumably before. And this is the main detention building that we're visiting. And Samir has, is uh, the director of the uh, Ishina Kalinovic Victims Association. So he's brought groups here before, but it's uh, Ida's first visit and my, my first visit as well. You can see that the building's abandoned and uh, actually Samir had to uh, shoo the, the sheep out of the building uh, so we could go in and uh, and just I just have a few slides so you can see the uh, the condition of the building and they they would like to preserve it as a memorial site and to turn it into a museum to educate future generations but there hasn't it hasn't been possible to arrange yet Okay. 
you can see it's uh, the building's in bad shape. And uh, it, af af after this, uh, I'll talk about that later, but after this, after this visit, I promised Aida and Samir that I would write to the top UN diplomat to try to urge him to uh, establish this site as a, as a protected national memorial site. And it, it, we found uh, some uh, writing that pr uh, the prisoners would have written about when they arrived and when they uh, left. It was, it's hard to see, but you can make out something like Doshau or Otishau and, so, and some dates. Uh, so this was Barutni Magazine detention site. And we're leaving, heading to downtown, you know, Kalinovic. And uh, the, as we arrived, you can see the mural of General Ratko Mladic welcoming visitors. Mladic was convicted of genocide and other war crimes as part of a second instance or final verdict on appeal. He's glorified in many places in different ways, but in, in this case, it, he, he's also something of a hometown hero because he's from uh, a, a nearby town, Bojanovici. Let's see. There, this is arriving at sort of the entrance to Kalinovic, you see. You're, you're uh, greeted by the saluting General Modic. Uh, and another view, it says, welcome. And then in, in the town of Kalinovic, there's another detention site where uh, more people were held than at, at the uh, warehouse. Uh, Miladin Radojevich public school is a principal detention site. There are other, other uh, concentration camps across Bosnia that were also schools that you know, have then been subsequently repurposed as schools. So this is once again a school where over a thousand people were held and then uh, Either, either deported or exchanged or taken to the the Barutni, Barutni magazine warehouse uh, and later executed. And this is a cemetery for some of the victims whose whose uh, human remains have been identified. Uh, so that's that's the the first part of of the presentation. The the second part. I think we have time for that, is uh, from about five days later, I went to Omar Omarska, and uh, this was uh, actually Skender's father and mother actually went, went with me. Uh, uh, and it was, we, we were a good team. And also uh, another colleague. So you can see on this map where Priador is located. Uh, Priador is in, in the Northwest, Northwest right corner of uh, Republika Srpska. So we went from Sarajevo to Priador. And in the Priador area, there were a number of fairly well-known concentration camps. I found that most people have never heard of Barutni magazine, but, but, but again, most people have heard of Priador and uh, Omarska. Omarska is where survive, another place where survivors have not been permitted to establish a memorial for the victims. They're allowed to gather one day each year on August 6th to remember the victims. So this is our, uh, this, I have some slides to show you the arrival at Omarska. So it, it is a mining facility, a private mining facility. So they've, they've reached an agreement that a, a allows uh, survivors and, and supporters to hold a memorial gathering for about four hours frankly. And they, they, send, they send us in the back way. This is the second time I had attended the commemoration. You can see the main 
building on the right in the distance. And between May 25th and Aug to August 21st, 1992, there were more than 3,000 prisoners who came through the camp. Approximately 800 were killed, and at least 620 have been found in mass graves. Uh, you can see a closer, closer view now of the, the main detention building on the right. The White House ahead was a, was a location where prisoners were taken to be uh, tortured, abused and tortured. And on the left is a, uh, the cafeteria or canteen where, where the prisoners would receive a kind of daily ration of bread and soup. So this is an area where, where uh, for the commemoration, uh, survivors gather for a short period of time. And the, the former uh, prisoners really are the ones who give, give uh, sort of testimony. They bear witness to their experience there. It's very, very emotional for them and, the, and their family members who, get, who gather. And in, in this case, I, I uh, oh, there was a, a president of the Association of Camp Victims who, who, who spoke, but then they asked me to speak. And I was so grateful that my colleague uh, Vildana was there who and was willing to translate so I was able to give a give a short uh, uh, statement in support of this in support of the uh, survivors, remembering the victims in support of the survivors, and also I called on the uh, the top UN diplomat to establish this site once and for all as a protected national memorial site. And this was uh, some press coverage. Shows I'm here with uh, Mirsad Chausevich, who survived torture in in the White House, and also uh, when he was trans and he was transferred transferred to Maniacha, uh, or if I'm saying that correctly, uh, concentration camp. But so that was the the point of my uh, comments at the commemoration was really to say we're to appeal to the high representative, the top UN diplomat, to finally establish this as a protected national memorial site. And, but at this point, you have the, uh, the assembly, people gather, uh, comp the survivors bear witness, and then we, we uh, lay flowers at the White House. In the, in the past, this year, I think because of the, uh, the pandemic, we didn't do this, but in the past, the survivors and family friends would, would release white balloons into the air with the, the names of the victims attached. In the, and all of this is in the absence of, of, of permission to install a memorial, even to install a memorial. Uh, before, it's just it's been uh, prohibited, and the only possibility is to is to um, have these gatherings. Now, in a, a, a nearby camp called Ternopolye, a memorial to the Serb soldiers, the perpetrators, has been erected on the grounds of the former camp. So you see, this is a discriminatory prohibition. Uh, sometimes I'm pausing because when I click on my PowerPoint. Nothing happens, and I'm hoping that we we go. So this is a uh, uh, a detention site. You can't quite see the school. There's another school that was used as a detention site at Ternopolye. This is a memorial to the the perpetrators, which uh, refers this plaque refers to the fighters whose lives laid the foundation of Republika Srpska. So they're being glorified. And this is, uh, might be an image that everybody remembers of Fikret Alic, who was in uh, Ternopolye at the time. And this photograph sort of confirmed the existence of the camp, the condition of the prisoners. And this is Time Magazine. It was also in British newspapers. And this was uh, Fikret Alic uh, in August. He's 
been there every time I've been there. She's really dedicated to uh, keeping the memory of the camp alive. And uh, he told me it's very, it's very traumatic for him to, uh, to go there to, to commemorate, but, but he's uh, committed to keeping the memory of, of the uh, genocide alive and, and remembering the victims. Now, there have been numerous efforts to arrange for a memorial in Friador and in Omarska in August 2018 and September 2021. I wrote an open letter to the UN diplomat who's responsible for overseeing the peace in Bosnia and asking him to support the installation of a memorial for victims. And, but that's not, not the first, those aren't the first letters. And, the, those, and this is just a couple of, a couple of images from uh, press coverage of the letter. So you can see an effort's being made. This, this says uh, Pettigrew is still waiting for a response from the high representative. And this was 2019, and we're still waiting for a response now. But this was the, uh, this was the most recent letter that I wrote on behalf of the working group for Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the current high representative from Germany, also asking him, uh, to make the commitment to, uh, to establish a protected national memorial site. Now, before, uh, just for a few minutes to conclude, I wanted to point out that there's a model for what I'm talking about, because between 2000 and 2007, a memorial center and cemetery for the victims of the Srebrenica genocide was established in Srebrenica in uh, Republika Srpska, but it was made possible by four decisions by three successive UN diplomats charged with overseeing the peace with these so-called bond powers. So this took about seven years, uh, four, four decisions. Then subsequently, so, so basically over time, they, they secured the, the land, they expanded the, the property, appropriated the buildings, set up, you know, set up a board, and then passed the law saying, this is a protected national memorial site. So it's in, it's in Republika Srpska in the entity where the, the Srebrenica genocide was, was perpetrated, but it's, it is in a sense protected because it's a, it's a, a, a like a national, I guess from an, from the, in the American vernacular, it's a, a national memorial site, like a national park. Uh, and then in 2017, the first comprehensive educational museum devoted to the Srebrenica genocide was installed within the Srebrenica Podachari Memorial Center in the building complex in which the Dutch UN soldiers were headquartered. So this, these are some images from the museum and educational site that's receiving visitors. And you see images and uh, as it turned out, I was a consultant for the completion of the museum. My, my job was to edit these uh, display panel, the text on the display panels. So this memorial center, uh, Srebrenica Center and Museum could serve as a model for the establishment of memorials at the other atrocity sites, uh, such as Barutni Magazine, Omarska, and Kostana Hospital in Stolac sites that Professor Hari Salilovich has called places of pain. Uh, one, one last uh, example is in Birchko district, which you can see here highlighted in red. Uh, Birchko entity, Birch, Birchko district was the site of a uh, con concentration camp called Luka, Lukuk. Luca camp and it's a uh, industrial park at, at, on, on, the, on the river, on the Sava River, where prisoners were held in, in this building. So this building is still here, uh, still there. And it's, uh, this, this was August, I think August 19, 19 when I was there. And it's, and it's been repurposed as a uh, industrial warehouse. This is former prisoner Is Isak Gashi showing where he was imprisoned and where he witnessed uh, executions, where people were killed. And he was, he was a very important witness in prosecution 
uh, especially in the uh, case of Goran Jelicic, who committed many atrocities and identified himself as uh, the Serb Adolf, with reference to Adolf Hitler. And uh, this is not in Republika Srpska. Birchko district, I could, it, it was established as a separate ent uh, area. So, so this, uh, they were able to install a memorial room, a plaque and memorial room. So again, this is a model for what, what could be possible for memorialization. You have both images of victims and also examples of, here's a educational map about the location of concentration camps. And, uh, but apart from the Memorial Room in Luka and the Srebrenica Memorial Center and Museum, and a few other examples, there has really been a uh, proliferation of memorials to those, to the perpetrators and to those who deny the genocide and a suppression of memorials for the, for the victims. So I, I couldn't find this slide, uh, a separate slide without me in it, but I, I still wanted to, I wanted to include it even though I'm in it. It says there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest was Elie Wiesel. And uh, uh, so I think we, we, need, we need to advocate for the, the right of memorial, human right of memorialization. Uh, so I, I, I see this as a project that students can, uh, can become involved in. So my thanks to Steve Armstrong, the Social Studies Supervisor, Connecticut Department of Education, Sarah Snyder, Director of the Hero Center and to Voices of Hopes, and to my colleagues who have uh, participated in the other workshops. Thank you, and David. Um, stop, stop sharing. What a fantastic presentation. I feel like I learned a lot and I have a lot oh. of questions. Um, so if anyone else has questions, I think we're a small enough group if you'd like to just pop on and ask and unmute yourself, that's fine. Um, I'd like to ask one question really quick. I was wondering in regard to the sites, um, have any of them ever been applied to, for example, UNESCO as a, as a site of protection? Uh, that I, that's, a, that's an excellent question because I, 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 I don't know. I mean, the, the UNESCO sites uh, are probably more traditional like the, uh, the Alaja Mosque is a UNESCO heritage site, and also the the bridge, for example, in in Visegrad, uh, the Mehmed Pasha Mehmed Pasha Sokolovich bridge, this famous Ottoman bridge from the 1500s, is a UNESCO heritage site. But the but you mean you, you mean the concentration camps? Right, right. Uh, but it would be interesting to see if there was a way to apply right for their protection. I, it would be interesting because I know Auschwitz Birkenau was added as kind of the first site um, as a concentration camp slash death camp um, to UNESCO's list. So I would be interested to see if it's something that could feasibly ah. be done uh, yes. to kind of protect it in the future or protect them in the future. But it seems like uh, in the case of, let's say, Barutni Magazine, first it would have to be identified as a camp. It, 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 uh, some, somehow um, Samir has been able to go there. I, I remember seeing Samir Ivanovich who was in the, some of the photos. He's able, they're able to go and, and visit the site and uh, have an, an, an annual commemoration. And uh, also there was, they, they gathered recently because there was an, a new mass grave that was discovered uh, in that area, although I think in the end it was actually there were victims from Srebrenica, not from not from that ex those local execution sites. But I think this is an excellent idea. I I can uh, I'd, I'd I'd like to I'd like to look in I'd like to look into that uh, in a, in a couple of ways. But but I could talk about what I was thinking about later. It'd be more important to hear questions or comments from participants. Sure. In relation to that, we do have one in the uh, comment um, slash question in the chat from Kelly, who says, I wonder if UNESCO requires state government support. It seems like it could be a good option. Um, 
I don't know, David, if you want to comment on that, but I can certainly comment. So whichever way you'd like to go. Oh, yes. I, 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 I don't know anything about UNESCO uh, recognition. It's, uh, it never occurred to me. Uh, so you said Auschwitz has been is a UNESCO site. Uh, and uh, but so you have you have all of these different all of these different sites that uh, like Barutni magazine, which is essentially abandoned. And I believe there was a decision by the military that it was obsolete and no longer of interest. But then the local say the, the local municipality has not taken any action on it. Uh, Omarska, as we pointed out, was uh, is is an active, you know, business. Uh, I, I was thinking that there's a, there's an analogy in I believe Mothaus, Mothausen had re, re, related subcamps, and there's there's a quarry where people were working uh, as uh, slaves during during the Holocaust, but it's also a private. A private mine you have to get you have to get um, or mining you know resource you have to get permission to go there so i, I think this is a really in, in, important question uh, we have another question in the chat from nick he says tomorrow is holocaust victims remembrance day many have pointed to the bosnian genocide as an example of our inability to prevent genocide how do we frame the bosnian genocide with the holocaust and other modern genocides uh, could you say more about what you mean by how do we frame it? I do you want to? Uh, yeah, sorry. I can, I don't know if you could. Um, I had just wanted to say like, we often kind of look at this. We look at like the modern examples of like the Uyghur genocide or even Rwandan one. And when we teach about the Holocaust, we, as we talked about the last couple of weeks, we talk about remembrance and like things people did to prevent it. And I don't know if, when I've taught about it, we, when I've learned about the school grant, when I was in like an elementary school, it was when this was happening, but I've just was wondering how, I don't know if any of you are on here have taught about something like the Bosnian genocide, because it feels like a lot of it kind of feels unresolved to a lot of people. When I've done this in high school and talking about it, I know that there have been like war criminal charge or war crimes charges, but we talked about, there's a lot of even if not as direct, a lot of remembrance and reverence of some of the war criminals. And I know there's still mm -hmm. amounts a huge amount of tension, but in, you know, obviously the former Yugoslavian republics and within Bosnia and Herzegovina over this issue. So I, I guess mm -hmm. I was curious what you thought about mm -hmm. how we can really teach the Bosnian genocide what is it really an example for our students of obviously we can teach the context of what happened, but it's, you know, a lot of time I, I remember I had a student last year who kind of commented that in a lot of ways it had kind of for him an unsatisfying conclusion that it's like, wait, so this conflict is still going on in a lot of ways, you know, that's a more realistic for most of these events, like conclusion than say something like the Holocaust and these are what leads to the foundation of the state of Israel but what do we really look at this for our students in, in what I guess either we can tell them that we can learn from it, like what the long-term results of this have been? I mean, yeah. I mean, we were like looking at the, the incredible complexity of this because it's unfair to say it's simply Bosnia. And we have, you know, the Cro we've got Croatia, we've got Serbia, we've got Bosnia, we've got all different players in here. Mm. So I, I hear two two separate questions there and i'll try to i try to um i think they're really important uh and uh i i'll try to respond uh quickly to both and uh, we could we could follow up later the first the first one is how you frame it maybe as a as a as an example of genocide a historical example and there there i think you have solid footing to uh unfortunately to chronicle the causes of the genocide, which are analogous to the causes of other, other genocides and uh, mass, mass atrocities. One, uh, for example, so you have uh, the uh, ideology of greater Serbia, right? Uh, the, uh, 
which was which really meant something to Milosevic and Sheshul. Uh, the uh, the the creation of Republika Srpska and the effort to render it ethnically homogeneous with hate speech, dehumanizing rhetoric, prop, prop, propaganda. Uh, so targeting a hated other uh, and uh, provoking fear and hatred, which M Milosevic was very effective at, as well as Karadzic and, and Mladic. But I mean, one of, the, one of the links you can make is that Milosevic gives a speech on June 28th, 1989, on the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo Polje, in which he's sort of demonizing the Ottoman Empire. And, and when, when Mladic takes over Srebrenica on July 11th, 1995, he, he refers to the Turks. And it's, but but there, there, are no, there are no Turks there. This is a dehumanizing objectification of the local population. As soon as he's talking about Turks and saying, let's get, re let's, let's get revenge on the Muslims. And so, there, but so you can draw a kind of logical line between the propag Milosevic's propaganda from uh, June 28, 1989. Uh, and, and the other, uh, in terms of the effects, you, uh, the concentration camps also help make a link to something like the experience of the, the Holocaust, an analogy. But there were um, there's also, uh, there are other, other atrocities, the, the assault on civilians, and also ways in which women were targeted, I alluded to in, in the, the case in, in Focha and also in, in Visegrad. Uh, Skender knows that he, he takes people on, on these very meaningful tours. Or in Visegrad, there's a hotel called Valina Vlas that was used to, to detain women and rape them. Mo most of them died, most of them were killed. That hotel uh, reopened as a hotel with the, uh, the same furniture in place at the time. And it's advertised today as, as, a, you know, as a tourist location that you could go to. And they, there's no memorial there of any kind. But uh, my point is you have the, the, on the one hand, the causes of the genocide, the, the, but the, other, the other aspect is you have now a, uh, because of the unresolved, the un, sort of the unresolved or incomplete nature of the peace agreement of the Dayton Peace Accords that left Republic Serbs, Republica Srpska intact, you 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 have the development in the last thirty years of a uh, of a, of, a, of a political administration that denies the genocide, glorifies the war criminals, and won't allow anything any of what we're talking about to be taught in public schools. Uh, Miller Adodic, the president of Republic of Serbsko, will say, you know, it didn't happen, it won't be taught. It didn't happen, so it won't be taught. And that, and he re, and he includes there, not just the Srebrenica genocide, but also the siege of, of Sarajevo. And, and the National Assembly of Republic of Serbsko established two, two so-called independent commissions to rewrite history. Uh, and at this, at this point, that's what Nick, Nick's question also brings us to something I didn't know we'd have time to, to talk about, but the, 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 the genocide denial, you know, uh, Gregory Stanton's uh, 10 stages of genocide denial, say denial is the surest indicator of a repetition of the genocide. Now you have efforts in Republika Srpska to blockade the government, to withdraw. They, they said in six months they will... Uh, they will form their own army, have their own constitution and uh, their own taxation system. And before that, they voted to form their own medical agency, which is a disaster when you're you know, responding to a pandemic. So you, in, in a sense, you have this unfortunate, uh, unfortunate example of how this un unresolved dehumanizing hate speech and genocide denial is, is leading towards the possibility of another, of another conflict. And people are addressing this every day, calling for sanctions from the US. The US just brought sanctions against Miller Dodic. The EU is moving in that direction. And uh, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK was no longer in the EU, but they're in the House of Lords. They had a debate that made it sound like they wanted to be back in the EU because they were strongly uh, supporting a reinforcement of U4 and uh, 
which was a, a kind of a, a, an e EU uh, military mission in, in Bosnia, but it involves about 700 troops. So it's, uh, it needs to be reinforced. But hopefully that answers the, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a very important case study and the, the lack of resolution is very, is, is very informative. Hopefully that was quick enough, it at least gets us started. Um, one thing I wanna add, so Kim, before she had to leave, as she oh. said in the chat, um, I think it's an important factor here is that it is in fact ongoing and there are no quick and easy resolutions. Okay. And I, I think that's an excellent point that genocide isn't something that just is easily wrapped up and finished. And I think that's true for all genocides. Um, so I think mm. making that point to students that just because certain aspects of genocide are over doesn't mean um, there are other things that aren't going on that stem from genocide. So I think that's a really good point to stress to students. Mm. Uh, I think we are all out of time, but oh, I want to... I thought we went to 4.30, but it's well, okay. I didn't mean... We certainly can, but I don't want to hold... Uh, I know we've had a few people who've said they had to go to meetings, so I don't want to hold anyone up from that. Um, I just but, wanted to see if anybody uh, had any other last comments or questions, or Sken Skender has any observations. He's living in Sarajevo as we speak about these uh, conditions. Hey, thank you, Professor. Yes, I, I, I live in Sarajevo, and I'm pretty much acquainted with all of the, 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 the stories Professor shared with us over here, guys. I mean, I would just like to add here for Nick, uh, if I may, just one minute. I mean, given all these insights Professor gave, unfortunately, today, uh, people who understand the Bosnian genocide and the story of Siege of Sarajevo, actually, they, 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 they start thinking that crime pays off, that if you go into that kind of cr crime, uh, kind of conditions in 1990s, and then 30 years later, you, you still have the freedom of denial and uh, political organization over these kind of uh, foundations, then people will think uh, the crime pays off that you can easily go and ethnically clean one region and one day uh, try to prevent anyone uh, to come and talk against that idea which happened in 1990. So unfortunately, that, in my opinion, could also be a important framework in, in which should genocide in Bosnia should be placed. Mm. But outside of my, my thought, uh, I professor is like uh, uh, speech was really, really great and really informational even from me, who is from Bosnia and uh, who deals with lots of these uh, genocide stories in Bosnia, because um, my work today is actually to bring students from all around the world and to show them the siege of Sarajevo, because I'm the survivor. I was six, seven years old when the war started here in Sarajevo and also stories of Srebrenica genocide and all other places in Bosnia. So it's great to share the knowledge. Well, it's great to see you and give my best regards to your family. I thank you, Professor. <laughs> nice to see you too. We have a comment in the chat from Kelly that says she agrees. Um, it does seem to validate the actions of perpetrators when denial is still the status quo. Yeah, Sarah, you, yeah. you want to just unmute? Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to cut anyone off. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say I really appreciate this. The, the, what you had said was the human right of memorialization, and that really stuck with me. Um, when I teach genocide as a mini unit in my human rights class um, and in my genocide studies class, but even when I teach it in world history, um, I find myself teaching it quite a lot, um, but whenever we do it, I always, like, especially when we do it in uh, human rights, I have them do a whole project on creating a memorial for their chosen genocide of study and you know like you, everything you had mentioned about not just the right to set up a memorial but in the different ways that it could look but even recognizing the trauma of revisiting and like what kind of services could be set up and stuff like UNESCO which like I'm a huge fan of of just like weirdly knowing a lot of UNESCO sites <laughs> and I never thought to connect those two um and all this is I've like anxiously jotting down all these notes and I had two other human rights teachers in here just like turn it up turn it up we need to write all this down um so I just want to say um I appreciate you just made our our genocide uh memorial project a lot better and I think a lot more meaningful and a lot more impactful um so thank you but um, I also wanted to say, like, 
I think the point of, you know, resolution and a genocide is a very important conversation piece for, for kids, especially as a nation that has a, like living in a nation that has a history of genocide as well. And talking about stuff of like, you know, what does generational trauma look like? What does, you know, modern day uh, disparities and discrimination that's based off of uh, genocides of the past, what, what does that manifest into today? Even if they're quote unquote resolved, like there's still such a echo of those problems here. So, you know, what might that look like in other nations and how can we still, you know, further our work to make sure that we can not just make sure it stops happening and like live up to that, but also um, continue, continue to like heal and reconcile with the ones that have happened. That's it, that's all I wanna say. So thank you. Yes, yes. and I think these, uh, if these memorial sites could be established by the high representative uh, as, as Srebrenica Memorial Center was, was established, it would be so important for educating the next generation because you can't, you, 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 they need, uh, people need to be exposed to what happened, to the truth of what happened. Um, and. I, I know Skender is taking people to Srebrenica Memorial Center and also to, to Visegrad. And in, in Visegrad, there were some, uh, uh, were described as the most heinous atrocities in the history of humankind by the, by the court judgment where women and children were put in the, the, a house and set on fire. There are two, two cases, the perpetrators were um, convicted of crimes of extermination as a crime against humanity. And one was sentenced to life and the other to 30 years. I actually asked the prosecutor why uh, he didn't get a genocide conviction for that. And he said, well, they were lucky to get the crimes against humanity conviction because, because the, the number of victims didn't rise to some level. In other words, there's some kind of calculus that they, they either, either it exists or they invent. But at any rate, the in 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 Visegrad, the uh, the authorities wanted to to destroy the the sites where this happened, so there wouldn't be any any memorial what's, whatsoever. So it's another case study. Um, sur survivors put a memorial in the cemetery with the word uh, genocide on it. It said victims of the Visegrad genocide, and the authorities broke into the cemetery and uh, and ground. The word genocide off the stone memorial so now there's just a, a scar on the memorial where the word genocide existed uh so there so memorialization is is a uh an, an, a human rights issue in bosnia but all, and also a, a, a very uh, informative or educational topic to bring up with students to think about you know what would be what would be an appropriate way to memorialize uh, victims. There was Skender, you probably remember, uh, in uh, Sarajevo, there was a, an amazing memorial where they set up eight, uh, 11,500 red 41. plastic chairs. Huh? 11,541. Pla red plastic chairs to represent the people who were killed during the siege. And uh, over a thousand of them were, you know, small chairs for children. Uh, so that was possible because it's in it's in the Federation, it's in Sarajevo, but it's a very uh, so memorialization can be uh, a, a, a very important activity if one's given the freedom to do it. And then on the hill above Sarajevo on Vratza Hill, from which the in a position from which the Serbs were attacking the civilians, there's a plaque commemorating Ratko Mladic because you go up the hill and you pass into Republika Srpska, so they're they're able to put put this uh, this plaque. I know it was attacked recently by somebody and, and smashed, but um, it, I'm sure it's still there. Well, that so that's a very very interesting comment. That's some really interesting ones. I actually, my I'm at my desk, so I have them like right next to me. But I saved a whole bunch of like student work from these this memorial project in the past. Like okay, like a timeline of uh, the resistance at Vaughn from a. Uh, Armenia and then like oh, this really yes. interesting one about the Cambodian genocide or no sorry this was the uh Canadian indigenous genocide mm -hmm. um revolving around uh like cultural drumming that the students did research on that was really 
fascinating and really mm. remarkable. Um, one on the Cambodian genocide that's based on uh, each sphere representing a certain amount of people adding up to 2 million. So like, and these are high schoolers that are doing this and it's like okay. remarkable what they can come up with. And I think it really, you know, drives home the point that like people need these. It really is healing, you know. Well, I think the, uh, the uh, efforts to memorialize the Holocaust, for example, across Europe are, are probably relevant to think about on the eve of the 77th uh, anniversary, the commemoration, right, of the uh, liberation of Auschwitz. But there have been so many important e efforts to memorialize that could, could be educational for, for Bosnia. And I, I was just thinking of the Stolperstein as, as one example. The, uh, or I think people call them sometimes counter memorials. Uh, or the, sh the shoes on the Danube, the cast iron shoes. There's like, I think 70 pairs of cast iron shoes along the river, the Danube. Uh, so hopefully Bosnia will, get, will reach that, that point. But uh, the, the situation needs to be, be stabilized, I think, by the international community. And there's a... Uh, there's a kind of uh, rising, the voices are rising across the world for this to happen. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk more about that. And I think Sarah was going to mention something about an upcoming workshop on denial, where I'll be, I'll be talking more about denial in the Bosnian context. I was. Do we actually have two upcoming workshops for February? Oh. Um, the first one is going to be the one that David just mentioned. Um, we're going to have a workshop on January, excuse me, January, February 23rd, um, which is going to be what is denial and how to address it. So we're going to look at different forms of denial and then also how to teach it, but how to respond to it. For example, if you have students who make comments that are in a form denial, um, if there are actions that are denialist or distortionist. So we're going to have that workshop and that's going to be a fantastic panel, I believe of five different scholars. Um, and then on the 28th of February, we will have um, another workshop, which is going to be entitled the Nazis look to US race laws, racial regimes in the 1930s. And that's going to look at um, the Jim Crow laws and the Nuremberg laws. So we will shortly be putting up different flyers for that um, and they will be available soon. And so they will will send those out and hopefully you'll be able to attend those as well. Uh, if, if anyone would like to reach out to the Srebrenica Memorial Center, let, let me know because they, they would be really excited to collaborate with, with uh, you know, public schools in, in Connecticut. And virtually and we also i believe we have another event david did you want to briefly speak about the dressmaker that's going to be coming up the dressmakers of auschwitz which is going to be hosted by southern oh yes uh, if, if i can remember the details it's uh, monday i believe it's march 2nd march 2nd that's a wednesday i think at, at uh, one, basically 1 p.m. to 2.30, which may not be convenient for teachers, but it's the, the academic community hour at, at Southern. Um, I'm hoping that some people would be able to attend, um, especially any, any of my students who are uh, on, on this call, but also uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, record it, right? And then uh, perhaps, a, Hero Center to put it on their website, but but we'll uh, we'll we'll get more information about that. Lucy Adlington wrote the book Dressmakers of Auschwitz. That's right. Thanks for mentioning that. Certainly, looks like a great book. It has fantastic reviews. Um, I look forward to reading it. So, I think if anyone else has any other questions, any final questions, comments they'd like to make. I just want to say I totally want information about like collaborating between what, what was it again it's the srebrenica memorial center it's the one place that you know really has been established as as a uh, a, a cemetery and 
Memorial Center. The, the victims oh. are still being buried in the Memorial Center because they're, they're still being discovered and, right. and identified. And then the, uh, on one, that's on one side. And on the other side, there's the uh, Memorial Center and this new museum I was showing images of. Right. So, I mean, we have in, in at, at the high school I teach, so human rights is a, is a graduation requirement here. So like every kid, literally every kid takes it. So we have a lot of sections of human rights in general, but we do have a handful of sections of ECE. So like UConn affiliated human rights. And then we have one section of genocide studies this semester and next semester we're hoping for two. Um, so we definitely have a lot of kids that would be interested in that. And we have a lot of teachers I know or at least I could speak for myself, one other that would be interested in, in seeing what kind of collaboration could be set up. Um, and I also um, at the school um, in the advisor for like the equity team, this like the student led equity team. And I'm sure that's something they'd also be interested in. So if you could send me any information or if we can like talk about that at some point. Um, okay. Well, you, totally I'll, I'll send everything to Sarah. You, you, you can find me at Southern. Okay. That's, uh, I grew up in New Haven, so <laughs> that's okay. uh, I'm always around there. But um, yeah, like that's, uh, you said that. I was like, I feel like that's something we could totally, we would totally yeah. be interested in. So uh, yeah, anything, send my way. I will send a follow-up email to everyone here with all the contact information and the recording and, and all those details. Um, and contact information for David as well. All right. Well, okay. thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, David, so much for that presentation. It was fantastic. And I, I know I learned a lot. Thank um, you. And if I will be sending out information about the next workshops as well coming shortly. Looking forward to it. Hope you all have a great week. Take care. Bye.